Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Canada Business Live. I'm Craig Aronoff, along with Bart Morris from the Cannabis Legal Group. We're here on a fine Friday afternoon, a uh, beautiful day out here in Michigan, pre-Labor Day. And we're going to be uh, having a nice discussion today. Um, what I want to do is first invite you to uh, like us, share us. Uh, we appreciate the feedback and the conversation. I also want to remind you to check out our, uh, we do have some links at the top of our page. Uh, the first one is the CannabisLegalGroup.com, Cannabis-Jobs. Uh, we're hoping to connect employees that are interested in the industry. And then also within our website, you'll see another one, Backslash Municipalities, where you can track uh, how cities and townships are reacting to uh, Michigan's Medical Marijuana Facility Licensing Act. So today we're going to be talking about federal government, a topic that we hear a lot around the state, uh, quite a bit of uh, interaction about it. So Barton, why don't you uh, start off and just talk to our viewers a little bit about what the challenge is when it comes to the federal government. We do hear a lot of questions regarding the federal government and it is one of my favorite topics to discuss. The, uh, the federal government, as most people know, uh, says that marijuana is illegal. They call it a Schedule One controlled substance. As, as a Schedule One controlled substance, the federal government has identified it as having no benefit whatsoever. Puts it up there in a class ne next to heroin and cocaine, saying that there's no medicinal benefit and there's a high potential for abuse. Uh, we all know that that's not true, but as it is right now, the federal government has scheduled, has scheduled marijuana a controlled one substance. And what that means is that federal agencies and federal departments are hands off when it comes to marijuana. And so those agencies are, are include uh, banking, uh, federal re regulatory banking laws, specifically probably one of the biggest problems that this Schedule One controlled substance identification problem causes, but way more than that, uh, the Department of Agriculture is not going, doesn't want to get involved in this plant. Uh, but in addition to the Department of Veter Veteran Affairs, they will not allow their veterans to be using medical marijuana, which is something that that many know people know is uh, a significant benefit to, to veterans who suffer from PTSD. Uh, the Department of, um, uh, let's see, oh, the Environmental Protection Agency uh, doesn't do any studies or doesn't any doesn't do uh, identify any pesticides that can be used for marijuana because uh, they will not they will they will they, they don't recognize it as a uh, as a as a plant or as a medicine. Um, the Department of all oh, the Food and Drug Administration, all of these federal agencies uh, have, will not touch marijuana. And then, of course, then there's the uh, Department of uh, Justice. The Department of Justice uh, wants to, with Jeff Sessions and, and Donald Trump, uh, the Department of Justice, specifically Jeff Sessions, wants to prosecute those uh, for marijuana offenses, even ones that uh, are uh, in, in compliance with the state medical marijuana laws. So. That's a problem as well. We get a lot of uh, questions about these issues, and uh, hopefully we're going to clear a lot of them up right now. Yeah, so we're going to break them down into in some sets, uh, you know, subsets throughout, and, and I think you did a great job of identifying it from a 30,000-foot view. And so, you know, there's a lot of misinformation about how the federal government has been reacting, and there's also a lot of... Uh, Concern, rightfully so, as to where it might be going. And so, as we break it down and we look at each department, we'll kind of see some hypocrisy maybe between how the government is treating it from one angle and then, of course, telling us how they might do it from another. Um, and you mentioned Department of Justice, and, and I think that that is, of course, you know, the, the front and center because this is where, you know, state rights, which we hear from all the time from, you know, a lot in the federal government, they want to respect state rights. And then at the same time, they might want to impair on those state rights where there's states like Michigan that have actually changed their constitution to allow for medicinal marijuana to be used in our state and deemed legal in our state, immune from prosecution locally. And so as we look at the Department of Justice, um, there, there's some things that we kind of see both from what Sessions is saying, and then of course how Congress is treating it. And we have to be really cautious about kind of mixing those two up because hyperbole and what's being said is not necessarily backed by the budget. So why don't you take a moment and describe what we mean and specifically uh, what's often referred to as a Rohrbacher Farr Amendment. 
Okay, so uh, every year Congress has to pass a bill called the Omnibus, Omnibus Spending Bill that will allow to fund federal government and all of its programs. Every year it has to be uh, renewed. And, uh, you know, this uh, Rohrbacher Farr is, is, is identifying the, the two uh, uh, congressmen that had been introducing this. Dana Rohrbacher is a Republican legislator, legislator from Cal California. And... He has been uh, promoting this bill or this amendment to the bill for for over ten years. I think I think since two thousand three, and finally in about two thousand fourteen, uh, with a ton of support from uh, Congress, a lot of co sponsors uh, to the bill, they finally passed it. Uh, they finally passed it and included it in the uh, the omnibus spending uh, package, and and it was signed by. Um, uh, uh, um, of course, Obama, uh, for the first time after 13 tries, I believe, uh, which is which is remarkable by itself. I, didn't, I just realized that, or I just found that out recently, because they've been trying for that long to try to get the Department of Justice to stop spending money on the enforcement of medical marijuana, or excuse me, on the enforcement of marijuana uh, violations that are uh, that are. Um, that are pursuant to medical marijuana laws in the state. And, that, and that's what it's designed, well, that's what it does. It stops the Department of Justice from spending any money on the enforcement of, uh, of, uh, of marijuana uh, uh, cases. And that's just the, the Department of, uh, I mean, the DEA, the FBI, and, and the United States Attorney's Office. They cannot, uh, they cannot do it, so, and that's a big deal. And so, and just so we can, and it's been upheld by a judge. I mean, correct. there's been judges that have said they've dismissed cases um, pursuant to this amendment. Sorry. Oh, no problem. It, it, we're both so excited. <laughs> All right, it's a, it's a topical thing, no doubt. Um, you know, it, one thing that's worthy of pointing out too, and and Barton was mentioning how Rohrbacher goes quite some time back. Well, why was he involved from California? Because California, of course, was the leading edge of getting into medicinal marijuana in terms of you know starting its program as far back as 1996 and you know the the congress representatives both from the senate and from the house in california have long since been working on that problem as it relates to all of the topics we've talked about be it department of justice or banking or whatnot but in the evolution of time in the same period of time that that's happened currently in 2017 there's 29 states that's more than half of our union that have some form of legal, medicinal, and in some cases recreational marijuana. So the math on that really says that there's 58 senators now and umpteen dozens of House representatives that represent individuals living in communities where medical marijuana is recognized as being legal and safe. And in other instances, recreational is allowed. And so the Congress as a whole has evolved. So when Rohrbacher first brought out the idea of saying, well, listen, if it's legal in our state, leave the federal government out. We'll regulate them. If they violate our law, we'll deal with it. But to the extent that they're within our law and compliant, the federal government should keep its hands off. And that's effectively the backbone of that amendment. And in essence, it took the money away to pursue that. And so over time, we went from a situation where there was a few, you know, a dozen states to two dozen states and now 29 states. And so that's why we're seeing more and more support from Congress, because more and more of their constituents are actually in the in, a, in you know, areas where they could be in jeopardy if the federal government were to pursue it. Um, also, what else happens locally, too, is, you know, if, if a county sheriff is asked by the DEA to back up and support a raid, for instance, they get reimbursed by the federal government. That's part of that budget. So that it's not our county cost, it actually is locally used for that, then they get reimbursed. And so what, that, what ends up happening with this amendment is there's no incentive for the local communities to police legal activity on behalf of the DEA. And then there's no money to reimburse them. And so that kind of derails the opportunity for the DA to pursue that locally and whatnot. And so this kind of conflict between the state and the federal government sees itself in a number of different areas. And of course, we mentioned Department of Justice because that's you know, where we see it the most. And that's probably fair, fairly the most feared. But another big area is research. And so tell us a little bit about how you see the research being impacted by it. 
large the large research like universities are not there will not engage in the research necessary to really truly discover the medical benefits of, of marijuana and cannabis that's a big deal and there's been a significant amount of uh, of, of information that has been held back uh, when the when the federal government because because it's a schedule one controlled substance uh, because it's a schedule one controlled substance when somebody wants to when a research a university or anybody anybody in the country wants to do some research so that they can truly do the work necessary to discover <coughs> the, the many things that we haven't discovered yet they have to get they have to go through um, a lot of hoops and, and, and many people many many companies and many uh, research universities are not interested in doing it and so that's going to be a huge deal when it gets descheduled and hopefully it's descheduled meaning it's not scheduled in one two three four or five at all or if it's rescheduled into two or rescheduled into the three it's going to open up a lot of uh, research activity and and then um, and it's going to be a period of time because that research takes can take years and so we've been right now we're already waiting for the federal government to open up something that we can maybe 10 years from now begin to really truly understand the medicinal benefits um, of, of this amazing drug. So uh, that, that's a huge deal is that the fact that this cannabis needs to be either rescheduled or better yet, descheduled. Yeah, and in essence what happens is, you know, universities apply to the federal government for grants. And so, you know, there's money set aside for specific research type of activities. There's currently one grant, I understand, that's been issued by the federal government relating to medical marijuana, and that's the University of Mississippi. Um, but I can say, I mean, imagine you know, Michigan State University with its agriculture, one of the oldest agricultural schools in the country, having the opportunity to really research not only for medicinal purposes, but industrial purposes around hemp and all the other things that will come with it. Um, and then that's just one. Imagine the University of Michigan and its health you know, medical center having the opportunity to review it and purposes of medicine and its oncology teams, Ferris State, Michigan, you know, Northern right. Michigan, Michigan Tech, all these schools want the opportunity to participate and have the talent and know-how and are basically on the sidelines waiting for the government to make a change. So research has, has certainly been hampered, but it's not like it's not existed. And that's one thing is we've gone around the state and talked to different communities that's a misstatement about where we're at with that. As I said before, California's been at it for over 20 years. So they've had R&D. It's been private. It's been not publicly funded by the federal government, but there is R&D. There is a track record of how patients responded to different forms of medicine over a long history of time. And that layers in Colorado, now Oregon and Washington, which all have been doing it for a long time. And now the other states that are as well. And so we're not seeing the federal government it caught up with mainstream academics, uh, that will come in time. But certainly there, there, we don't want there to be an impression that there isn't research. There's actually a ton of research in the U.S. the way we've prohibited it in terms of our use of our federal dollars has really put us behind the world as it, re as it relates to this. And so, you know, a lot of the research that is done is in an attempt to research the negative benefits or the negative impact of uh, cannabis, like on driving, for instance. Uh, a lot of the research that's done in the world has a lot to do with the physiological impact of cannabis on, on driving and on our bodies uh, in, a negative, in a negative way. Uh, so we have, there's a ton of research on that. Uh, but the research that's gonna get opened up when the drug gets rescheduled. Uh, it's going to be talking about, and, and people are trying to be identifying the, the significant medical benefits. They're going to be trying to figure out uh, what is the proper dosing, uh, what, are the, what are the different types of cannabinoids that are going to be helpful in different types of um, illnesses, which ones are, what, what combination of cannabinoids is going to work best on, on cancer or on glaucoma. I mean, literally, the, the, the possibilities are just amazingly endless uh, to, to, the, to the benefits that we can, we can determine the type of research that is necessary. Um, and so that's, that's, that's something that we have to look forward to. Uh, absolutely. And, and I was talking to a gentleman just the other day in the farm community uh, in the south part of Michigan, 
who the idea that they can actually genetically engineer the plant so that it does not have THC or has low THC or maybe no psychoactive effect from the processing of the medicine was really foreign to him. And he's a farmer. And the more I talked to him, the more he recognized and the light bulb went off as he was thinking about his own crops and how they've kind of helped to maintain the best output and to find the right seed that's needed for whatever their output was. And so conversationally, we were able to get to the ground floor of it, but having the, the back set of research and the rest of it to come with it is going to be huge. And of course, with that, that's where the FDA rolls in. You know, most medicines go through a process, a time-tested process to determine if it's safe for the user. And here we have a lot of users that have gone through a lot of safety measures. There's all sorts of, uh, you know, studies now, and at least in terms of the actual real-life impact, where the, the overdosing isn't there, the overuse necessarily isn't there as to why prescriptions have issues. Um, but the FDA controls that. And so until the federal government reschedules it, you know, uh, an innovative company that might find a non-psychoactive medicine out of the use of extracts can't even put it through the review process so that it can maybe become a drug that could be prescribed. I believe there's two right now that are being prescribed through the FDA. And, and again, they're using cannabinoid oils and whatnot. But they're not necessarily as robust as where we can go given the opportunity. And so again, as we talk about medicine, the FDA that controls all of it um, should have the opportunity not only to review it from the pills and from the medicinal standpoint that we commonly think of, but also the food. We, we hear about medibles, edibles. So that's another area where it'll be different. Yeah, and then, you know, let's talk about what's the likelihood of like federal... Um uh, oversight of medical marijuana in the future like is it is it is the federal government or is let's say Jeff Sessions is he going to be successful uh, in in pursuing his objective to basically wipe marijuana off the map or is there going to be a change is the federal government going to uh, really provide really do reschedule or deschedule cannabis and then provide for the regulation that uh, that perhaps is necessary and and if you ask me, I'll tell you that I, I think it's a certainty. I think that Jeff Sessions is never, or anybody else for that matter, is never going to be able to put, put to stop everything that has been going on in, in the cannabis industry in the United States. It's a $20 billion industry. And there, have been, there has been a significant amount of money and investment and jobs created. And there's been a lot of obviously a lot of medical benefit, a lot of people that are relying upon this cannabis. In order to, to take that away from everybody uh, would cause such an uproar, it would cause such huge litigation, and it would cause the, the marijuana community and activism to, to be at a level that I don't think that even the federal government would be able to deal with. I think that it is much more likely that the federal government, in fact, I, think about this, Along with the Rohrbacher Farr Amendment that has been passed, and, and by the way, was signed by Donald Trump this year. So Donald Trump did sign a pro-marijuana bill this year, just a few months ago, uh, to continue to disallow the Department of Justice from spending any money on enforcement in medical marijuana states for marijuana uh, uh, offenses. There have been almost or perhaps even a hundred pieces of legislation introduced into Congress this year in 2017. And right now we're only into September, say September 1st, a hundred different pieces of leg legislation trying to change the law, the federal law regarding marijuana. Um, Senator Booker, Cory Booker from New Jersey. Uh, some people think that he may be a Democratic candidate for president coming up. Uh, he has just introduced a very wide-sweeping bill to, to not only reschedule cannabis, but to even wipe out uh, criminal convictions that have, that have been, um, that have been that, that for people for, that were cannabis convictions. I mean, he has, he has put forth uh, legislation to revise the banking that is necessary for federal banking uh, reform. Uh, and he's also supporting uh, research, cannabis research. Uh, these bills may not work this year. They're probably not going to, but that doesn't mean that they're gonna stop. Like I said, the Rohrbacher Farm Amendment had been introduced in every single year 
uh, or not every year, but since 2003. So, like, but it, but most of those years, like 10 of those years, have been introduced before it was actually accepted. And the same thing is happening with legislation, with legislation that's being introduced now. Uh, just because it doesn't work this year, it's still gaining momentum. It's gaining more sponsors. It's gaining more traction. Those 29 states that have either medical or recreational marijuana, they make up 75% of our United States population. And therefore, they should make up 75% of our United States congressmen. And um, 60 or 58, a number of 58 of our, uh, of our senators. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this legislation, they're getting, co they're getting more co-sponsors and they're getting more bipartisan support. So it's not just Democrats. Remember, Dana Rohrabacher, he's a Republican. Uh, he's from California. But we are getting a lot more support from, from bipartisan. We're getting support from both sides. That reminds me of um, the Michigan. So let's talk about Michigan real quick. Which senators or which congressmen from Michigan have supported this cannabis reform legislation? And there is um, only two, my understanding is. One is John Conyers, who has supported the, the Warbacher Fire Amendment. And then there's another uh, gentleman from Grand Rapids. Um, he's, a, he's a Republican, he's, and he's co-sponsored um, maybe only one or two bills. But it's been very, very short. As much as Michigan has had medical marijuana since 2008, the Medical Marijuana Act, we're about to go into a, an entirely new... Um, uh, uh, year commercial. with respect to our commercial uh, commercial regulation, there's only been very small um, and act, there's been small activity from our from our own spot, from our own legislators in uh, Michigan, which is disappointing. So uh, I would suggest that anybody that has any type of influence, which we all do, we're all Michigan residents and we're all voters, uh, that we should get our Michigan legislatures more involved in the cannabis caucus uh, that exists in Congress. And get them to sponsor some of these bills. Get them to sponsor the bill that was just introduced by Cory Booker on August 1st. Because that's the type of uh, support that these bills need in order to get some traction and eventually begin to have a chance of becoming law. So, you know, and, and as we mentioned Michigan, and I think I made the comment in previous you know, Facebook Lives, and, and certainly you and I have talked about it a number of times, our state is completely bipartisan on this issue. As we drive around the state and present to different communities and talk with different supervisors and trustees and city council members and village board members, it's really remarkable that the politics of it really don't have any center. You know, it's both the left and the right and it's everywhere and it doesn't, it seems like, you know, community by community and person by person, they're just on board. Um, you know, those that aren't don't really fall into a specific, you know, space in politics. It's really, it's a remarkable thing. The far right and the far left agree on that. And that's why I think it's, it's fair to say that's where Congress is headed. Now they just got to act, you know. Getting Congress to act is a whole separate thing than what they might want to do. And that's Justin why it's, Amish is that guy's yes, name. That's right. And, uh, Justin Amish. So, um, you know, practice. and just so, you know, as we, as we talk about the politics of it all and a couple other areas that might come up is, of course, you know, the Department of Veteran Affairs, for instance. They spend billions of dollars on opiates literally billions and they're doing that for pain management for of course veterans they're doing other medicines for ptsd and other issues that are our, our veterans uh, more than deserve and, and need to be taken care of but you know what they're not allowed to get from the, the va marijuana. medical marijuana it's the craziest thing in the vast a healthy percentage of our veterans understand that marijuana is a better source of medicine for their needs than the prescriptions they're getting from their doctors. It's, more effective. it's way more effective and, and it actually, if anything, complements some of the medicines they're getting for their issues that they have and maybe prevents you know, a, a lot of the adverse effects of those medicines. So that conversation, again, from a federal level needs to continue for, for those budget hawks. Guess what? It'll save some money. For those that are interested in just finding solutions for our veterans, God bless them, it'll find a solution. But, you know, banking was something that was kind of front and center as we started the conversation. I want to circle back to it because cash on the street is one of the biggest problems in the industry as a whole. 
you know, as people talk about security of facilities and people worry about, you know, theft and this and that, these facilities are, are fortresses. They're, they're like banks. They're not getting broken into very often if they are at all. That's sort of a, a misstatement as to where the crime might relate to it. The bigger issue is you got to pay your employees in cash. You got to pay your vendors in cash. Taxes, you got to pay your taxes. You got to pay your taxes in cash. So what you're doing is you're creating a situation where people are leaving facilities with cash in their pocket. They're leaving to go places to deposit it if they can. And so and without, they can't even take credit cards. That means that means people, patients have in to come them. in with cash, right? And absolutely. And so you know we that we're fortunate to be able to do you know electronic payroll. And so it's, wake up on a Friday morning, it's in your account. If all is good and, <laughs> and all that. And so you know, <laughs> but but the reality is is that um, you, you know these 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 employees they walk three four blocks from their their businesses where they're working and they get mugged. The, the vendors, they leave and they get followed. So people know when they leave casinos, they got to watch the fact that if they're leaving with money in their pocket, they got to be cautious. Every employee in the industry has to do that unless there's a banking solution. So let's just clarify. What about the employees then? They have banking so problems they too. They Absolutely. can't get mortgages. So they, if, if, a, if an employee, if their entire income is from the marijuana industry and their entire income is then in cash, then they may not be, they're going to have difficulty getting a mortgage because a bank... Loan. Or a car loan. They can't right. get to work. That's that's crazy. Yeah, and so and let's just clarify what, what we really have in the banking industry because it's, um, it's a project that we've been working on a lot here at the Cannabis Legal Group and hope to be able to provide this solution to our clients. Um, but, you know, the COLA memo, which is a memo from the... Uh, in a, in a, an assistant attorney, the James Cole. He was yeah, assistant, attorney general. He was a uh, assistant attorney general yeah. under um, Eric Holder. That's right. And so he wrote a memo talking about backing off law enforcement in areas where there was licensed medical marijuana. So that's sort of the general umbrella where it falls under. And then FinCEN, which is the department that actually regulates and you know looks at financial crimes, they wrote a memo that effectively said, "Hey, banks, although it's illegal, if you're going to do it, here's some guidelines." And so they kind of recognize it's a need that has to be met rather than something to be enforced upon. And so it puts the burden on the banks to really be the ones that discover the money laundering and if that's the problem that they're seeking to deal with and puts the onus on the banks to really be the enforcer of it. A lot of banks don't want to put themselves in that position. So the amount of regulatory requirement for the bank to actually participate is very high, but those that will can offer solutions to their operators as long as the operators understand the type of scrutiny literally could be day to day in terms of explaining every penny that went through their industry and their, and their company. Now that being said, I think any operator coming to Michigan should expect you're going to get audited. Not once, but regularly. It's a common thing, especially from the IRS, but also from the state treasury. And so to that end, having the banking doing their auditing with you daily or bi-weekly or whatever the deposit times are, you're basically giving yourself the cleanest slate to work with. So between you and the bank, there are ways to do it, but you have, you have to have every I dotted, every T crossed, and be willing to put yourself in the front side of the regulatory scheme, not waiting for changes that affect you in trying to bend the corners the way a lot of people might think they can. If you're a dispensary, you're going to have every penny accounted for, and the bank is going to vet that. Every time you deposit $10,000, you're going to report it under an SAR form, a suspicious activity form, to the federal government, reminding them you're a marijuana business. And so all these things are going to happen, and that's the only way you're going to find some banking in favor for you. But if you don't follow those rules, they're going to throw you out. If you go to them saying you're a lawn and garden shop, they're going to throw you out. And so that's very important that our operators understand compliance, 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 and be willing to be audited. And guess what? You do that more and more, the federal government will start to feel confident that we can operate without fear of money laundering. I think those two go hand in hand. The more that do it, the more feedback the banking industry is able to give the federal government. And who's one of the biggest lobbies in, the thing in Washington? The banking industry. And if you don't think they want to, don't want to get their hands on this money, they do. they do. They just want to do it the right way, and they don't want to be the enforcer. And I think that's a very distinct difference between them all. So, well, we had a, a pretty wide-ranging conversation today about federal government. Um, certainly, we appreciate the time, and uh, we'll look forward to bringing you our next 
Can of Business Live next Friday. And uh, for Craig Aronoff and Bart Morris, thank you very much. We'll see you next